Welcome back, everybody. Um, very excited to introduce our second panel on race and class. Um, uh, welcome back from our break. And I want to ask to the podium Professor Jeannie Sook Gerson, who is the John H. Watson Professor of Law here at Harvard Law School, as well as a contributing writer in The New Yorker, who you sh whom you should all be reading all the time, uh, as one of our boldest voices on law, gender, and American public life. Um, Jeannie will moderate and introduce the panelists. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jane, and thank you to the organizers, and thank you all for being with us today. As we move from the age of Roe to the age of Dobbs, sorting through the narratives and practical realities of race and class is among the most urgent and controversial challenges of working on the law and politics of reproductive justice. It has been a feature of arguments and storytelling for both pro-life and pro-choice concerns about pregnancy and abortion access. In 1927, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, a son of Harvard, wrote his most notorious line, three generations of imbeciles are enough. He was referring to Carrie Buck, a poor white woman whom he described as the daughter of a feeble-minded mother and the mother of an illegitimate feeble-minded child. Holding that it was constitutional for a state to forcibly sterilize women who were deemed mentally defective, he explained that it is better for all the world if instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring for crime or to let them starve for their imbecility, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. This reasoning, of course, reflected the eugenic thinking of many socially progressive views of social welfare, um, much of its pedigree emanating from Harvard University specifically. That case, Buck versus Bell, was cited with approval in Roe versus Wade for the specific proposition that it was indeed constitutional for states to limit women's reproductive choices, that the constitutional right to abortion that Roe announced was a limited one. And when the court reflected on the detriment of denying a pregnant woman the choice of whether or not to have a child, it focused on the harm of forcing upon her a distressful life and future, the taxing of her mental and physical health because of childcare, the problem of bringing a child into a family already unable to care for it. And the court notably worried about the additional difficulties and continuing stigma of unwed motherhood. The stigma of unwed motherhood, of course, has different valences, whether you're thinking of the unwed mother as white or black. In the years leading to the overruling of Roe, Justice Clarence Thomas gave voice to the idea that abortion rights are an heir of racist eugenics, stating in 2019 that abortion restrictions could promote a state's compelling interest in preventing abortion from becoming a tool of modern day eugenics. And he linked the eugenics of Margaret Sanger and her promotion of birth control in poor black neighborhoods to contemporary rates of abortion of black fetuses versus white fetuses. So then we saw that in Dobbs, Justice Alito continued the narrative of, of abortion rights as racial eugenics by quoting from an amicus brief filed by African American organizations that argued that some abortion supporters have been motivated by a desire to suppress the size of the African American population. He repeated the idea that a highly disproportionate percentage of aborted fetuses are black. After Dobbs, we have continued to hear pro-life or anti-abortion people describe their opposition to abortion as a racial justice concern. And of course, pro-choice concerns have also centered on race and class, namely the highly disproportionate impact of Dobbs on poor women, women of color, more of whom now lack access to abortion and reproductive health care. 
The eminent speakers on this panel have deep experience in the examination of race, class, and reproductive rights. Kiara Bridges is a professor of law at UC Berkeley. M.T. Davila, chair of religious and Theologi the theology studies and associate professor of practice at Merrimack College. And then Melissa Wild, who is a professor of sociology at the University of Pennsylvania. And additional information about these speakers can be accessed through the conference webpage. After their individual presentations, I will moderate a discussion and a Q&A. And audience members are welcome to submit their questions at any time during the session, and we will get to as many as we can. And if you are watching in person or online, you can, you can submit your questions using the Slido link that is provided on the screen behind me and posted in the chat of the Zoom website. Thank you. Melissa? Thank you. I'm going to be talking about the, some of the findings from my recent book that's titled Birth Control Battles, How Race and Class Divided American Religion. Um, for some context, I'm a pro-choice feminist whose research on the history of contraception is horrible news to most other pro-choice feminists. Um, and in that position, I hope we can um, make some progress. My research started when I noticed that between 1929 and 1931, nine of America's most prominent religious groups suddenly liberalized on contraception. By suddenly, I mean within 10 years prior to that moment, they had all said contraception is bad. Contraception is evil. Contraception is the devil. You should not do it. In 19, between 1929 and 1931, all of a sudden, nine of the kind of most prominent, largest, most important religious groups suddenly said, actually, that's not right. Contraception should be legal. And so I thought, <clears throat> I sought to figure out why. And in doing so, I did not study just the nine liberalizers. Instead, I created a sample of 31 of America's most prominent religious groups, Protestants, Catholics, Jewish groups, that represent 90% of people who claimed a religious group in 1926. Um, I used census data, archives, and most importantly, very detailed keyword searches of each group's periodical between the years of 1918 and 1965. The research took me 10 years. It's important to, I think, acknowledge that as an academic. What I found was that there were no groups who supported contraception who are not openly eugenic, eugenicists. There were no groups who openly promoted contraception who were not eugenics, eugenicists, excuse me. There were a few groups who were also feminist, but they were also eugenic, eugenicists. They said things like this, and it's important, I think, to listen to their words carefully because when we talk about eugenics, we often don't understand the ways in which they were really open about their views. So in 1929, the periodical The Congregationalists wrote, knowledge of birth control should be widely and freely disseminated so that among certain groups in our civilization, there may not be more, but fewer and better children. In 1932, the Christian Register, another prominent periodical, <clears throat> simply asked, shall we harness heredity to produce better types of cattle, dogs, and horses, and do nothing with it to produce better types of men? These are just a couple examples of the hundreds and hundreds that I found in my research. These concerns these statements come from, came from a concern about race suicide, which was a term coined to implicate the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant women who were not having more than two children. The suicide part of the term was to 
express the idea that by choosing to have fewer children than undesirable populations at that time, in particular, Catholic and Jewish immigrants in the Northeast. And I'll talk about why this was different in the South if folks would like to hear about it, if I have time. We're having about four children. This is the birth rate differential that was behind immigration reform and immigration restriction. This was a crisis on the part of uh, on, in the, <clears throat> many people who were concerned about the future of this country. There were eugenicists in the American religious field who did not support contraception, but they did not support it because they were whites who lived in the South and benefited from Jim Crow and also lived in places where whites had higher birth rates. So there's the really um, depressing reality that my work, I believe, leaves unquestioning. Fast forward to 1965, the end of my book. It's amazing when you get 10 years of research into five minutes. Um, by 1965, the eugenics movement had really gone underground. They stopped talking openly about the word eugenics most of the time. But you can see an incredible connection between where we started in the 30s and where we ended up in the 60s if you just look at their language. And so in 1965, they were talking about the malignant growth of world population. We are breeding disaster. Even saying things like, why are doctors and nurses striving to heal the sick in India when that country can't support its present population? And of course, instead of focusing on the rapidly whitening Catholic and Jewish populations in the United States, they shifted to a focus on urban Negroes who were, they claimed, disinclined to use contraceptives even if they could afford them. These are all in the periodicals of major religious groups. But it doesn't stop there. I found that these groups really forgot the reasons why they were supporting women's rights, contraception, and abortion. Within a generation, it was really obvious in the periodicals that they had decided to embrace being progressive sexual religious groups or sexually progressive religious groups, feminist religious groups, without an understanding of why, how they got there, how the laws or the statements that they supported were on the books. So for example, there were lots of statements like, because we were the first denomination to say family planning was a moral necessity, the church has a particular moral responsibility to take the lead in seeing that their communities have family planning facilities. So while they forgot the reasons behind their activism, one important point needs to be made, and that is none of the activism that I found was ever about giving women the right to determine their own choices. It was about making sure there were fewer undesirable babies. But what is the takeaway for today? Is, am I saying that currently pro-choice activists are racist? Do I agree with the Supreme Court on the basis of my research? I have to fall back on the very rigorous research methods that I hold myself to. And I think there's one main takeaway. People say what they mean. People say why they are, have the views they have. People who are white supremacists, they say it. 
And we need to start, I think, from a perspective of taking each other on honest grounds because the data's there. I didn't have to really read between the lines. People say why they support something. And so I think we have to move beyond the very idea that abortion restriction is because, is there because there are some white people who want fewer black babies. Because if they, I'm sure there are people there who believe that, but they're gonna tell you that's why they think it should be there. So that's all I have to say today. Thank you. Thank you. MT. Um, I want to thank um, the conference and our panelists and um, Melissa for your passion. And it brings me to a point that I have brought up with the planners, which is to, at some point yesterday and today, to acknowledge that we're all holding a lot. Um, our narratives, our own personal narratives, our community's narratives, um, and the discussion that we're having and the space that has been opened up for us here means that we come with a lot. And so I just want to acknowledge that and um, whatever means of self-care that means for you and, and for us to exercise it and to be gentle with each other as we're having this conversation. Um, we are being very generous, I think, in being here, and uh, all of us. So I just want to put that into our space and say it openly. So I'm going to start with a story. I was born and raised in Puerto Rico, the youngest of six children. My mother had eight pregnancies altogether. After her first and only natural birth to her first child, born with spina bifida and dying at six months of age in the early 50s, my mother had six C-sections, myself and all my siblings. We used to joke that the ghastly scar she bore on her lower abdomen worked like a zipper. The joke was hilarious until I found out that Puerto Rican women are 26% more likely to deliver their babies by cesarean, with little difference between deliveries in the mainland as, uh, versus the island, and that currently, almost half of all births on the island of Puerto Rico are by C-section. These statistics, of which my family is a prime example, highlight one of the ways in which Puerto Rican women have experienced violations of our sexual autonomy and reproductive justice for over 500 years. For black and brown women in the Americas, sexual autonomy and reproductive justice is intimately connected to colonialism and conquest, government policies of experimentation, urbanization, and population control, capitalism, class, and race, immigration, and even language. I'm not here today because I'm an expert in any of those fields. I am a theological ethicist by training, focusing my work in the areas of racial and migrant justice and public and political theology. In those three areas, I pay close attention to the role that gender, sexual and reproductive justice, and the moral language used in various public spheres by power brokers claiming religious and moral authority play in determining the welfare of vulnerable populations. I am also a Catholic woman and a mother of four, three of whom are assigned female at birth. I am, by all accounts, pro-life, but have historically been critical of pro-life efforts, like the March for Life, for some of their racist tone and practices, often dismissing collaboration with groups committed to racial and reproductive justice for the sake of the moral purity of their cause. I have written on the damaging impact of the culture wars on efforts for racial and economic justice in the nation, highlighting the way the culture wars have atrophied our moral language in the public square, effectively providing space legitimacy and support to extreme right positions and candidates. My most recent focus has been on developing the concepts of the moral ecology of sexual and reproductive justice, and moral tragedy as more helpful categories for conversations in the public square among various positions regarding reproductive justice, concepts that break from the limited culture wars language to open spaces for a fuller spectrum of experiences of women, AFAB persons, and their communities. Recently, two Puerto, Ric Puerto Rican physicians shared the study of the history of population control for the sake of racial purity and poverty reduction in Puerto Rico since its takeover by the United States in 1898. 
A particular highlight of their study is a new review of the forced sterilization programs of Puerto Rican women in the 40s and 60s. According to their work, these efforts sterilized 150,000 Puerto Rican women without their consent. According to the LA Times, a number of women who were detained in an immigration detention center in Georgia in 2020 continue to suffer today the after effects from procedures done to them, which included forced sterilizations and the removal of the uterus, ovaries, and fallopian tubes, according to reports by independent medical experts and interviews. Some of these women still do not know what exactly was done to them. Of course, the story of sterilization of black and brown women in detention centers and prisons is unfortunately extensive. In addition, the U.S. southern border is terribly inhospitable to pregnant women who cross and are detained, and various administrations' family separation policy that has led to thousands of children being taken from their families at the border, a significant number of whom continue to be separated from their parents. And currently, state like, and I mean currently this week, states like North Dakota and others are scrambling to put into their laws the protections that the Indian Child Welfare Act of 1978 had put in place to protect the integrity of Native American families and avoid the removal of children, because at any moment, and it, we thought it, would, it was gonna be this week, the Supreme Court could rule in the case of Brackeen v. Hallen declaring uh, ICWA as unconstitutional. I lift up these particular examples, because while during last night's fantastic panel, Michelle Bratcher Goodwin raised the historical abuses to black and brown women's sexual and reproductive lives, and Getty Israel spoke eloquently and fiercely about the crass injustice of conditions on ground zero for black women in Mississippi. Threats to indigenous and migrant women's sexual and reproductive autonomy are a nationwide, everyday occurrence. Indeed, the moral ecology of sexual and reproductive justice in the US and its territories does not begin with Roe v. Wade and its story. It includes the story that began in 1492 and 1619, with the colonization and conquest of the Americas, the enslavement of peoples and the capitalizing of black and brown bodies, ruthless government policies that permitted medical experimentation in whole segments of the population, and that today continues to threaten some of the most economically and racially vulnerable communities and families in the nation. What's more, as a pro-life feminist, I have never seen anyone in pro-life marches lift up family reunification at the border or the treatment of black and brown women in the prison industrial complex or the unwanted medical procedures performed on women in detention centers. Perhaps this is due to a rather limited understanding of personhood that privileges the personhood of the baby in the womb. However, this philosophical and theological anthropology how the pro-life movement and the culture wars determine and speak about the personhood of the unborn is not free from the impacts of 1492 and 1619 and the commercialization of black and brown women's bodies. The moral language of sexual virtue and reproductive ethics that have dominated the culture wars produces an individualized and atomized understanding of personhood moors the public conversation on the rights of the fetus versus the rights of the mother, rather than acknowledge the morally unique and essentially under, underdeveloped set of relations and interactions produced by a pregnancy. This limited moral language of the culture wars also fails to lift up the moral ecology of sexual and reproductive justice that includes entire communities. Urban planning, for example, the design of our roads, the ways highways sliced, sliced black and brown communities, leaving neighbors and kin uncommunicated, is a life issue and part of this moral ecology. Indigenous sovereignty in the US and elsewhere is a life issue and part of this moral ecology. Environmental catastrophes, air pollution, climate migration, and how we come to resp respond to migrant families at the border is a life issue and part of this moral ecology. These are all part of the moral ecology of sexual and reproductive justice because they, these are conversations, practices, assumptions, and policies that impact the neighborhoods, the lands, and the environments needed 
to have healthy family units in the various ways that different cultures and groups have come to define it. As a theological ethicist, it's in my wheelhouse to reflect on the values that are used to ethically analyze an issue and determine the best course of action that honors those values, optimizing the good being done and minimizing harm. Sexual and reproductive justice, however, confound many ethicists because we are instructed in a very limited set of values and stories on which to ground these kinds of assessments. What are typically called the pelvic issues in Catholic moral theology, sexuality, sexual orientation, reproduction, contraception, and abortion, are usually analyzed through a fairly narrow lens that does not take into account the broader sets of relations of responsibility involved leading to the very limited and often violent language used in the culture wars. Currently in the culture wars, there is no moral ecology of sexual and reproductive health that is decolonial, anti-racist, anti-patriarchal, and I mean truly breaking down patriarchal violence, not just installing access to reproductive justice for a few as window dressing. Environmentally just, that honors the various narratives of our peoples and the ways these forces push down on our communities. In the current moral ecology, tragedy is an important category to lift up. It recognizes that we fall short of building the kinds of environments, governments, and policies that optimize our ability to make the best choices for our lives personally and for our communities. It is a moral tragedy that our sexual and reproductive lives take place in racist, sexist, violently capitalist colonial spaces where it becomes almost impossible to say with confidence that we are truly free to decide when, with whom, under what conditions we wish to, wish to be sexually active and reproduce. The existing, existing limited moral language does not allow us to engage the full scope of social justice issues that are part of the moral ecology I've referred to. Under these circumstances then, tragedy is in fact the most useful cate moral category. It is the one that helps me be here and reach out to others whose views are completely different from mine, but who are subject to the same unjust and violent systems. I found a kindred spirit in Getty Israel. She said last night, that she wasn't here to debate anyone for or against abortion. She was here looking for partners. In changing the conversation and the terms of public discourse on sexual and reproductive justice, that's what I hope to do as well. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to moderate a, a discussion that um, will incorporate the questions into the discussion. Um, Kiara, let me start with you. Um, you are a lawyer, as I am, and we um, work in the frameworks of law and uh, legal decisions, as well as the facts on the ground that may um, in, inform those discussions. One of the things that um, you are emphasizing is morbidity in pregnancy, severe morbidity, disproportionate impact of that on black people who are pregnant. And the, um, on the other side, we've also heard ideas, you know, the, the use of um, the morbidity in, um, in giving birth in um, counterposed to the idea of severe health effects of having an abortion. Right? And also the idea that it disproportionately affects certain populations. And it, um, so one question I have is kind of standing above it all, one starts to feel like some of my students do when they're in the legal discourse, um, like it's, it's narratives all the way down, right? That it's like you can, uh, th there's a flippability to all of these kinds of concerns and arguments. And so how do you think about that when you are making arguments using legal discourse and also the, the facts on the ground? How do you deal with the fact that all of them, all of these arguments from eugenics uh, to disproportionate racial impact, they are flippable. They have been flipped in, our, in what, we, what we see in our history. 
Thank you for the question. Um, I think, huh, I love that narrative's all the way down. Mm -hmm. Well, first, um, I think I would prioritize um, <laughs> empirically documented truths. Um, so when um, some narratives are based on, again, claims that don't have any basis, at least have not been substantiated by research, um, I'm more inclined to be more dismissive of them, if you will. Um, so claims that abortion harms people because they have higher rates of you know, breast cancer or um, just can't, reproductive cancers or higher rates of um, mental health sequelae that are damaging. Um, I, you know, once I see the research that supports that, then it would empower me to take those claims a little bit more seriously. I do know that there's research, though, um, that um, has provided evidence that abortion um, has positive health effects for those who want them. And in fact, when um, they are turned away, they are harmed. Um, and I'm specifically referring to the turn away study, um, showing that people people who are denied abortions when they want them actually have um, mental health um, problems in terms of anxiety, depression, they're stuck in abusive relationships, they are mired in poverty, and so on and so forth. So again, I think that there is a role of, of research, and I'm so glad that there are so many researchers here who can help us uh, flesh out the facts um, and not just the narrative. Um, and I think the sec my second response to your question about its narratives all the way down, um, I am, and maybe it's because, I don't know why it is, but I just pri I privilege the narratives of people as they tell them to me. Um, and I, um, which means that I give priority to people's experiences. Um, and so if people experience abortion as harmful, then absolutely you should not have one. Um, but if abortion is experienced, um, as many experience it when wanted, um, as something that is empowering, empowering, as something that's liberating, as something that allows them to navigate, you know, I, my remarks um, were intended to just give some color to the constraints that people are navigating. And when abort and contraception and abortion are techniques that help people navigate these constraints that we have not worked hard enough to dismantle, um, people tend to experience abortion as empowering and I would uh, privilege that narrative over others that would um, dismiss it as false consciousness or, or um, stupidity. Thank you. Um, so this is adjacent to the question that I asked Chiara. And um, one of the, all of the um, research that you presented to us today, right, I think you said to me off stage, I think a lot of people in the pro-life movement would like some of these facts that you have unearthed. Um, and the reason, of course, is evident in the way that the Justice Thomas particularly, Justice Alito to some extent also, um, that you can see it in their written opinions because be, saying those facts, saying, that res saying the, what, what you found in your research has an implication that can be mobilized, namely that what happened in the 1920s and 30s is um, a close continuer, or some kind of continuer. Um, and the continuation of that way of thinking led to pro-choice um, abortion support. Um, and on the other hand, of course, the pro-choice community looks at the horrors of forced sterilization and thinks of that as uh, their, their support for abortion as continuing the opposition to taking choice away from individuals about their reproductive lives and futures. So there, again, the, um, just to emphasize the flippability again of the, the idea of like what in history um, have we continued to what we see today? Um, and, and this is, and, and our discourse about Roe and Dobbs is replete with this. And so as a historian, as a researcher, what do you make of this? You're trying to unearth the truth, and then that, tr that truth will become folded into 
the political narratives and the legal narratives that really do actually affect um, what is going to happen in our country. So how, how do you think about that? I was surprised to find that the eugenic nature of contraception reform would lasted well through the 1960s, and I was surprised to find the extent to which um, concerns about race suicide or the quality of our population, our, our babies, really um, formed the basis of my discipline as a sociologist and absolutely formed the basis of related disciplines such as demography. Um, and so it, in, uh, on the one hand, it's been a um, really eye-opening and disturbing uh, finding. I think I'm probably not answering your question, though, by saying all those things. Um, I think in terms of how does that inform today, um, I think the best, the best thing I have to offer, the most important thing I have to offer is that um, you must we must be able to believe the reasons that people give for why they have the views they have because people will tell you the truth. Now, that's not to say that there were not people who were intentionally duplicitous that I studied. In fact, the American Eugenics Society intentionally, it seems the archival record um, is very clear, intentionally folded in 1931 the president of the American Eugenics Society, who oversaw its demise from 29 to 31, was the first president of the Population Association of America from 1931 to 1935. Um, he started the organization. It had the exact same focus, only, uh, it, it, and there began the shift from a focus on the problematic babies in the United States to the problematic babies in the rest of the world. He became the president of the American Sociological Association in 1936. So it, you know, I feel like there is not, um, it, I think, yeah, I think I might leave it at that. Okay. Um, thank you. MT, I'm, I'm very interested in your idea of moral tragedy. And um, there's language of tragedy, and there might be resistance to that language on, on the side of pro-choice activists to the extent that abortion, um, for some of them, abortion, like we heard from Renee last night, abortion should not be seen as something you don't talk about because it is um, a tragic occurrence, but rather something that is part of life that you are honest about. And I'm, of course, not, not implying that you wouldn't want to have such honest conversations about what that is. But, um, on the other hand, there is the language of power that is also very much part of your language of tragedy about conditions of subordination and of oppression on the basis of race and sex and class and all of those that you, I think in your remarks said, prevent us from being truly free. And that also implies something about the language of choice. Right? If we're not truly free, what choices are we making? How are we making those choices? Whether the choice to be intimate with someone or the choice to have exercise certain um, rights to have an abortion or to give birth. Um, and so I wanted to press you a bit on the idea of power and if we're not truly free and it's not um, so simple as to say, I have a choice to do this or I have a choice to do the opposite. How do you think about this war over the language of choice that has come about in questions about abortion that you are, in your, in your framework, thinking of in the language of moral tragedy? Thank you. Um, so the reason I try to turn to that language um, is, is precisely because I find that it's a language that encapsulates the moral ecology we currently are in. Um, so some people talk about late stage capitalism, um, obviously you know, patriarchy over thousands and thousands of years, and, and the kinds of violence that that imposes on a population. I also try to do moral theology, again, I, I mentioned that a few times, within the confines of um, a, a theological ethics that's very heavily shaped by 
the events of 1492 and 1619, right? very violent events that shaped the Americas um, and the theological ethics of the Americas. Why do I, I bring that up? Because when you talk about you know, power, freedom, and choice as, as some, some of the key languages that come into play, as, especially with public policy, I don't think, I, I think that they preclude us from sitting at a table and having conversations with partners that differ greatly. So for me, the language of moral tragedy, when I get to unpack it with conversation partners, it allows us to begin to agree on some things, um, like every family should be able to have that village that we talk about, right? It takes a village to raise a child, where what are we doing to those villages? Um, and to the way that different communities define those villages. Not every community has the privilege to have a village for every child that is to be born, right? So within the, the framework of that which we are destroying because of our various forms of oppression, um, does the term moral tragedy helps us to sit down at the same table? Uh, and I bring that up because, for example, it, it, it became a, 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 a problem, a conflict uh, a few years back um, when the March for Life in DC did not want to allow a Black Lives Matter group to march with them. And that, that was a failure. That is a failure of our ability to establish relationships with people that, and collaborations with people that have a very similar, um, some very similar goals um, that have to do with that village and, and with uh, uh, establishing the conditions for families to thrive. Um, but we don't sit at the same table. The Catholic bishops, for example, have been sort of very vocal about not being able to talk to Black Lives Matter on the basis of the way it talks about the family, its particular definitions on family and its particular definitions on things like choice, oppression, and freedom, um, and Marxism for some reason. Um, and, and I think that's a mistake. So I'm, I'm looking at that term in the hopes that it allows us to sit at the same table with various actors and various players and begin to agree under the conditions in which we are now, which are fairly violent toward families, um, uh, on some common goals that we can share and work on together, like uh, um, Getty was suggesting last night. Mm -hmm. So continuing um, in that line of questioning, one of our audience members asks about these facts about black maternal morbidity and mortality and how they might be used to justify not merely the idea of giving choice to pregnant people, but also maybe paternalistic control, such as civil commitment or surveillance or tracking with modern technology, right? So again, you can take the facts of severe mortality, it can lead you to think what is needed is choice to have abortions. And I think the questioner is wondering about other directions that that might point, including increased paternal, paternalistic surveillance and control of choices. So I've spent, my, my, my first book actually was about um, uh, prenatal care um, and the state's management of low-income people's pregnancy um, through healthcare, uh, with a desire, with the with the stated aim of improving maternal outcomes as well as um, infant um, health outcomes, um, and it's very paternalistic. My goodness, um, that's the punchline of the book, right? Like the punchline of the book is when you are poor and you need to rely on states um, provided health care, you have to be an amazing, amazingly strong individual to maintain your dignity and autonomy while navigating those institutions. So I'm very sympathetic to the argument um, that uh, these, these facts about um, maternal uh, mortality and morbidity can be um, used for regressive um, purposes um, and put to oppressive ends. I want to really underscore what Melissa, if I may, has um, said, which is we need to start listening to people. 
And when you actually listen to the folks who are most likely to die from a pregnancy-related cause, they don't tell you that they need health care alone. <laughs> they tell you that they need food, clothing, shelter, child care. They tell you that they need the ability to vote. <laughs> They tell you that they need jobs. They tell you all of these things. And when you just respond at the moment of pregnancy and say, okay, here's some health care for nine months, it starts to seem a little paternalistic, right? Um, when people, when marginalized people throughout history have told you that they would like contraception and abortion, but they'd also like food, <laughs> clothing, shelter, health care, jobs, the ability to vote, and you only respond with contraception and abortion, it starts to seem a little eugenicist. It starts to seem a little paternalistic. It starts to seem a little oppressive. Um, so I am really um, skeptical about responding to individual phenomena like maternal mortality and morbidity, like the desire to terminate an unintended pregnancy, um, without responding to the structures within which people exist. Because if inequality was diminished, um, then I don't think we would have as much moral tragedy as we have. Um, if, if structural conditions were not so violent, we wouldn't have the rates of maternal mortality and morbidity that we have that, again, have persisted across the generations. Um, and then we wouldn't need to respond with these emergency programs that try to save people li people's lives only during the event of pregnancy. Um, if people weren't available, if people didn't have access to health care only upon the moment that they became pregnant, but rather had access to health care from birth till death, um, then the, the program of prenatal care wouldn't seem, it wouldn't be so paternalistic and oppressive. So anyway, that's my invitation to all of us to think holistically um, and to not think in terms of very discrete issues, but think about the context in which these issues arise. And that might allow us to have different conversations and broader conversations and allow us to make more radical interventions that would actually produce the terrain upon which people can be actually autonomous individuals living lives with dignity and humanity. So Melissa, there are quite a bit of um, audience questions for you that are clustered around a few issues, and I'll try to synthesize them. Um, one is about white supremacists, eugenic support, uh, support for eugenics, and you you detail the um, shift in the abortion supporters' discourse from eugenics to uh, something different. And I guess the questioner is interested in the white supremacists, their shift from you being uh, eugenicists, supporting abortion and contraception, to dogmatic op opposition to abortion, in the words of the questioner. Right? And so that sort of, that the other side, there was a shift, not just in one, um, in one side of the debate, the other side also shifted in kind of a similar or 180 degree direction. So I think uh, the questioner is interested in that and also why the eugenics movement went underground and how that connects to the policy failure to stop of, um, adverse maternal outcomes. Hmm. <laughs> um, so I think we should probably step back and say um, my book is particularly on the U.S. case and that the that eugenics, as we saw in the first panel, is relevant to all kinds of contexts and today, too, um, and that white supremacy and eugenics look differently, look different depending on where you are. Um, what the shift that I really noticed in my research, you know, from 1918 to 1965 was um, the shift that was important in terms of what I was trying to understand was the eugenics movement went from a focus on American babies and how to make them better to we need to have fewer 
black and brown babies in the rest of the world, and it also in the inner cities in the US. So the shift was kind of, the concern was about what kind of babies we need to have fewer of. And I really think it's important that people believe <laughs> that that was the focus of the population control movement. Population control means fewer babies of a certain type. And, you know, we have to start with that. I, um, so, you know, how does that play into um, white supremacy? Um, I think when it comes to, to white supremacy, um, like I said, it, the, the, the very openly white supremacist groups in the, um, in the South that I studied were, were they, they wrote things that said like, um, we're not worried about race suicide. Last week there were 19 babies in the hospital in Atlanta or whatever town they were in. Well, of course they didn't say it, but those were white babies, I'm almost sure. Um, and uh, so it is about the contact, it, it's about context, it's, it's about it, you know. So why do we care about the race of babies? Can we count the race of babies without detrimental consequences? I think these are really important questions. And of course, I'm a sociologist, so the very idea of not gathering data is horrifying. <laughs> I'm not saying that we should become France and, and not ask about race. But I have begun to ponder the question of um, whether we can ever find, seek that information without um, at least opening ourselves up to um, very horrible consequences within the social structures that we've been talking about that exist in our country and in the world. Um, I think I'll stop with that. Okay. So this next question, I think it should, I, I, I think it's inspired by um, Melissa's presentation, but I think all of you have touched on this and, and I would really like to hear from all of you on it. The idea that people will tell you the truth Right, I think you said that, Melissa, and I think, Chiara, you're saying people are telling you certain things about what they need um, and what they believe. And so let's start with MT. The idea of people will tell you the truth, what does that actually mean? Does it actually, um, uh, is there a psychological perspective or a religious perspective that goes into that question? People will tell you the truth. Is that true? <laughs> I know, I'll give the definitive theological answer. No, I'll tell you how I treat, how I treat people's narratives. Um, and, and I try to tell my students this, and that is I, um, I exercise a preferential option for suffering, for the narratives of suffering. Um, people will, I think we can take them at, at value, they'll tell you the truth, but I, I tell my students it's very um, hard to fake suffer. Um, it, it, when someone is experiencing um, angst, pain, any particular kind of suffering, um, there is a lot of truth in that. It's where, we, where I feel we are at our most authentic. Um, and, and that, to me, bears a lot of information. I, I'm a Christian, so for me, I, I hold the cross as also another sign of truth, right? So, and that's suffering. That, the, the cross is significant for many reasons for Christians, but I think in terms of an epistemology of how we approach people, it's one that says privileged suffering because it's, it's where we, we ought to focus. Um, and, and I think when, you know, as Kira says, when, when people tell us what they need and we only are listening to one little specific thing because that happens to be either the language of the culture wars or the language that's popular or what we're focused on and what we got money in our grant for or whatever, um, because those grants are shaped you know, by certain narratives, um, you wanna hear their narrative of suffering. You wanna hear their narrative of what's at stake for them in order to thrive and what's at stake for them in order to build their village, in order to, um, in order to collaborate um, with you on, on things. So, my, I think my contribution to that question would be that, to, to really have an epistemological preference for suffering when people talk about their truth. Melissa? Yeah, I would love to follow up on that because um, while I do 
believe that people will tell you why they think what they think. And I, and I know they will, and that can be very important data. I don't want to give the impression that that's enough. Um, because people's truths are determined and or clouded by their structural position. And so the, the role of social scientists, in my view, is to take the truth, take what people say is their truth, but to find patterns in those truths and to explain those patterns. And so it's not just enough to, because if we're just left with listening to people's truths, I don't think we're gonna make much progress at all, right? We need to be able to uh, reduce the really messy social world into patterns that we can explain and ideally get um, leverage on to make better policy interventions than we have been able to. Um, I think I would respond um, to, by saying two things. In one sense, when I say, when I think when I in, responded to your initial question um, about narrative, um, that's one sense in which we can talk about people's truths, right? So when there is a narrative that says abortion is harmful and people suffer when they have an abortion, and then a person who actually terminated pregnancy says, well, I feel just fine, right? Um, then that, that becomes a counter narrative. This truth that the person has articulated becomes a counter narrative that then we have to frame and shape in a, in a certain way. Um, but I'm less, I'm less interested in that because I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a theologian, um, I don't have any sort of expertise in truth telling in, in, in that um, sense. What I think I would like to believe I have an expertise in is like the demands of social movements. So that's what I meant when I said people will tell you what they need. Social movements have told you, have told us what they need. And when we respond to the list of demands that they have articulated with just one policy intervention that happens to be racist <laughs> because it is deployed in isolation with all of the other demands, well, then we're not actually listening to the demands of social movement. So um, that is the truth that I'm talking about. The truth is, is the, the demands that people have arrived at, um, at in consultation with communities that are under six, uh, similar um, conditions of structural violence. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. So this, is, this will be our, our last question, and I, I would um, like to hear from all of you, if, if possible. Um, and it is related to what we just talked about, and it has to do with the presentation or deployment of what it is black people think about abortion. And so you do see um, the representation of black people's needs, beliefs, and in public opinion polls, and you know, just, and so you see on the pro-life side the idea um, that a majority of black people actually don't support abortion rights or don't like Roe versus Wade, right? And then you, it, you see the discourse um, and um, empirical studies um, showing either going the other way on public opinion or also showing the way in which a lack of abortion rights disproportionately negatively affects black people. So I don't, I don't mean to put these on some kind of equivalent footing. I'm just pointing out that the idea of the truth as to what black people need um, or poor people need is something that is very much a live issue on both sides of the debate and will be going forward. And so I, I wanted to get your thoughts on that. And especially, Melissa, did you do any studies, one of the questioners wanted to know, did you do any studies on like black religious organizations, uh, primarily black or religious organizations during that era that you studied? Uh, yes, I did. There were two historically black denominations in my sample, um, one conservative, one progressive. Um, both were very openly aware of the eugenics movement and countered birth control 
either the progressive group stayed silent because they couldn't support birth control for the reasons that was being supported by the white groups, uh, and the um, conservative black denomination uh, just said, you guys are crazy, we're not gonna support that. Like, yeah, we know why you want to limit babies. Um, I would say I've also done research on kind of the contemporary period and, and abortion and, and survey research in general, and I would say, um, as a sociologist, I can I would say black people are very pro-choice, <laughs> um, far more you know more so than whites in general, regardless of their religious beliefs. Um, it, that you know one of the things that I've tried to. It, I'm talking nationally representative samples and kind of trends in public opinion. Um, and uh, they're also very pro-redistribution. They, and um, that those, those things are actually flipped when you look at whites and in the intersection of religion. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll just um, begin and answer, and this will be very brief. Um, I hope we all giggled when you posed the question about what black people think about abortion. <laughs> um, I did, um, because we're an incredibly heterogeneous group, yes. right? Um, so to, to believe that we can say in a sentence or two what black people think mm -hmm. um, is, 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 is funny to me. Um, but that being said, I hope that my remarks showed that abortion is not isolated. Um, and so when abortion restrictions take place within the violence of our dysfunctional healthcare system, right? We're like one of the richest nations in the world with like the poorest health outcomes, right? So when abortion restrictions take place within the violence of a dysfunctional healthcare system, when it takes place within a violent criminal legal system, we respond to everything with police and prisons and prosecutors and probation, right? And then when abortion restrictions take place within the failure of our democratic institutions, like where we're in a couple of years, if we stay on the same trajectory, um, to call our system a democracy would be a misnomer. <laughs> when abortion takes place within those conditions, I feel comfortable saying I think black people need abortion um, access. MT? I feel like I want to leave it with Kara's comments. I very powerfully Excellent. stated. Well, thank you all, and thank you to the panelists. So, I, so the third time in this conference that I've been just overawed by what I've seen and heard, I want to underscore MT's word generosity, the generosity that you all showed to each other in your critical listening practice um, and to this audience and back from this audience um, gives me hope for the future of higher education, among other things, so thank you. Um, we now have a 75-minute break. We'll see you back at 1.30 Eastern for both the roomies and the zoomies um, when we talk about uh, Roe and American public life. Thank you all again. <laughs>